we are live. Welcome everyone. So today we are going to talk about the number one question I think a lot of people ask us, which is, do you regret buying a truck camper? Especially coming from van life, that has been a question in a lot of people's minds. And we've also gotten a lot of questions that we've kind of compiled over the last almost year that we've had our truck camper. Um, and we are going to work on trying to answer a lot of those today. All right, here we go. First question we always get, do you regret getting a pop-up truck camper? And I would say the most basic answer to that is no, we don't. Do you? I'm, no, not at all. I mean, I, there are a lot of other questions that have come in about um, around this and why, but you know, for us, when we were living the van life, it was a very specific type of travel we were doing. We were in a two wheel drive ProMaster van and we could go all over the country. We did camp at a lot of different uh, campgrounds. We also did a lot of boondocking, but the one thing that was missing for us was that we couldn't really get off the grid. We would go to some kind of off the grid locations like in Flagstaff, but it always had to be a well graded road. Um, if there was rain or any type of weather on the horizon, we were kind of SOL because the van really wasn't good in mud, wet, even wet grass, we got almost got stuck a couple times. So I would say for the type of travel that we've wanted to do, which is go off road, explore places. When we get to an obstacle, we know we can get past it and have a very robust vehicle to do that in. This has been perfect for the type of travel we want to do now. And I will say we've been on the road. We celebrated five years of this lifestyle and we've done 46 states. We had Alaska left mm -hmm. and part of the reason we built this rig was to go to Alaska. <laughs> Obviously with things going on, we can't, we couldn't go to Alaska this year, but hopefully sometime in the future. And we really had that place in mind with this vehicle. And, you know, after you've seen a lot of the cities, the paved roads, um, and having passed up a lot of forest roads and roads that looked pretty sketchy that we mm -hmm. weren't too comfortable going down, it's nice to be in a vehicle where we have the confidence and we know we have the ability to get out there but more importantly get back out um, if the weather turns or we get stuck in soft sand any number of things and the best part is joe just finished a off-road recovery course yep so he has the skill set to get us out i mean it's one thing to have the vehicle but if you don't have the knowledge and the skill set to use the tools we have to get us out then it's yeah it's pointless because yeah. you get stuck out there and a lot of the places we go, you are a long way from help. And if you can get help, it's gonna be expensive to get someone to get you out. The second most popular question we've gotten is, do you miss the van? No. I, I would say the one thing, and we'll touch on this a bit later, is there was that it was nice having uh, the same compartment where the driver's compartment is part of the house and you can just flip around but to be honest we don't miss that. The follow-up to that is having switched from the van to a truck camper without a pass-through a lot of people ask us if we miss having the ability to get from the driving compartment right into the camper. And I would say at first we did miss that ability um, because we were so used to it. You would pull up somewhere, it didn't matter what the weather was or what was going on, you flip the two front chairs and your driving compartment has now become part of your living room. And it was nice having all of that and when we needed to leave, we didn't have to go outside unless we had to unhook, us, unhook ourselves from power or something. Um, but that said, we've also realized that there are some real benefits to having your truck cab separate from your living space. For example, when we're doing all of this off-roading, um, you know, a lot of times we'll have our windows down or even if we're running the AC and things, uh, a lot of dust will get into the cab. And we'll get out after a day on the trail 
and our entire dashboard will be covered with dust, right? Mm -hmm. Everything in there, dusty, dirty, nasty. Um, if it's wet outside and we're tracking mud into the cab, that gets in there. And what we've realized is by having these two pieces separate, when we get into our living quarters, it's not dusty, it's very well sealed. Um, we can take our shoes off if we need to before we come into the house portion and you're not getting all that dirt and grime and all the nasty stuff from the cab. The other benefit is when you're in a van, you're listening to everything behind you rattle around, um, all your stuff in drawers, a lot of times the cabinets or the refrigerator, things like that will rattle as you're driving down roads and it almost sounds like a big echo chamber. Well, you don't get that with the truck cab anymore. It's nice and sealed and you're completely separated from the living portion and all the stuff that might be rattling around in there. So it makes the driving experience a lot nicer. Is a pop-up truck camper safe? <laughs> this has come up from people for a multitude of reasons. One, because we have, as you can see, canvas yep. sides all around the upper portion of the camper. Um, there's also a concern that because our living quarters and our driving quarters are separate, there's no way to get in between them without going outside, that if you do have something happen in the, you know, bump in the middle of the night, you have to deal with it. You, you just can't drive off. So my answer to the question as to whether or not it's safe is I would say it's just as safe pretty much as anything else. Um, one thing a lot of people don't consider is that if you have, you know, I think one of the biggest segments in RVing is trailers. For trailers, you have a separate living quarter and a driving quarter. Um, if you are at a campground, regardless of what type of camper you're in, there's a very good chance you're plugged into something and you're gonna have to get out and disconnect yourself before you could drive away safely. Um, for us, you know, I think there was an initial concern of whether, you know, someone in the middle of the night could cut through our canvas top and come right in, but it's... We've done so much aftermarket work to this truck. It is, it sits so tall. Yeah. Someone would need a ladder to get up to the canvas portion and get inside. Yes, it would be extremely difficult. And a lot of people have said, well, they could just climb up your truck. Well. As you see at the front and back of this camper, it's actually hard sided. You can't cut through this and just climb in. Um, we wouldn't be worried about being in bear country. Again, a you know unless a grizzly bear is going to get on its hind legs and somehow figure out a way to get in here, it's going to be difficult. Um, you know, I would say the diff the most difficult way to get into this camper to break into it would be to come through the canvas top. It would be, if someone was going to break in, it'd be much easier for them to break a window and just come right in. And looking back on camper van life, you know, if someone wanted to get into our camper van, they could do it just the same way they get into a car. They break one of the side windows, open the door, and they're in. Uh, and that would be really quick and easy. It would be quite a feat to get into one of these undetected and unnoticed before, uh, you know, someone who was living in here could deal with the situation. So I think that's primarily my response to, is it safe? We certainly feel safe. Um, you know, again, there is that, there is, I would agree that there's a concern about, let's say you have a bear or a bad situation around you. Um, you're gonna have to get out of the camper and get in the truck. I would say anything, if something is happening while you're in the camper, you're gonna have to deal with it before you can drive off or somehow like, jump out, run into the truck and drive away, right? Mm -hmm. But I've never felt any more or less safe in this than all the other campers we've been in. Exactly. And we've also gotten questions from people about like, how quickly could you bug out? Um, we could bug out almost immediately in this. Uh, some things might fall over. We may want to put <laughs> some things down, but you can drive this with the top up. Um, I, if you had to, if you really had to do it, if you were on some bumpy roads, really bad situation, wildfire, something's coming through and you got to get out immediately. You just drive with the top up and you, you deal with any damage later. Um, you know, outside of that, it's this, we could, we can pretty much 
pack and unpack this camper almost as quickly as we could our camper van. You know, we talk about safety and preparedness quite a bit, and we've shared a lot of information on our website. So if you are looking to live this lifestyle and you have questions, um, head over to wordtherussos.com and type in safety in the search bar and you can read our article there, um, which I think has some pretty good resources for you and things to consider. Yeah. Now this is a question we get a lot. How do you live in that? People, especially from the outside, will see our camper and <laughs> think that this is just, uh, it's like micro, there's no way in the world you could live in here. People all the time say, well, I have to have a, a toilet and a shower and this and that, and we have a toilet and a shower in here. Um, we have two showers. Yeah, actually we have an outdoor shower and an indoor shower. And this is the indoor shower right here. This area, yes. We, <laughs> that's in a video. If you go to our YouTube channel and check out the walkthrough we did of this, we explain how the shower works. Um, but, you know, it, this actually has more room than our camper vans did. It's wider, uh, the living space is longer, and the bed is significantly bigger than any van we've been in. The interesting thing is when we meet people and we invite them into the camper, they'll come in and they stand up here and they're like, wow, there is a lot of room in here. It didn't look that big from the outside. Uh, the ceiling goes up 6'5", so there's plenty of room for taller people in here. Uh, we've had, what, six people in here at a time? At one, <clears throat> yes, six. Yeah, so we've had six people, four at the dinette, Kate usually sits on top of the toilet and then there's another bench seat over here which you could sit two people there if you wanted to but we've all sat in here with friends having drinks and just hanging out for the evening and it's really comfortable for everybody mm -hmm. um, so for us once we kind of got over the small space of being in, in well we started in a class a rv that was 30 feet long then we went down to a camper van and now we're in this and you just get accustomed to being in smaller spaces. So when we come in here, it's more about, we've learned how to best utilize that space and you know, how to, how to get along together so we don't kill each other. <laughs> yeah, and we just celebrated 15 years of being together. Yeah, it's been a while. We're still together, so that's a good <laughs> sign. <laughs> uh, so more on the living out of the camper part, mm -hmm. um, the other question is, do you have enough storage and the power system? Sure. We have more than enough storage, more than any of the vans we've been in. We There is quite a bit of storage inside the camper itself. Uh, we have the tray, so the flatbed itself has storage boxes on it and we put a lot of stuff in there. And, you know, in one of our videos, we showed how we converted the back seat of our truck to a storage area. And I have all my tools back there. We have a hanging closet. Uh, we could fit a full size spare on that bench that I built. And it is, I mean, we, we carry more stuff in here than we ever have before. And I think just because we have the room to do it, we could probably get rid of a lot of weight and a lot of stuff by taking it out. But I don't know, do you feel like we're missing any storage in this? No, and I think based on our moving in video, <laughs> we've I've said, made it pretty clear that there is a ton of storage in here. Yes. <laughs> people, people were kind of, there were drinking games that were started because of that video <laughs> and how many times we said storage, but I think that just, that under, that really shows like how surprised we were about how much room we had for stuff when we started going through this. Um, now to talk about the actual functionality of the camper itself, we have three battle born lit total of 300 amp hours, which runs everything. Uh, those batteries are charged through 260 watt solar panels on the roof. And we also have an additional 120 watt solar panel that is external that we can deploy when we need it. Uh, we also have a 2000 watt pure sign inverter and that powers all of our outlets. So Kate uses her instant pot all the time. Um, every time I make coffee, I use a thousand watt electric kettle. And for the most part, we've been able to go as long as we have decent sun almost indefinitely. 
the camper is also hooked up to the truck so anytime we're driving our alternators are actually sending power back and charging the batteries all of the charging uh, solar the inverter if we ever plug into an outlet which we've never really needed to do uh, all of that goes through the Red Arc Manager 30. It's kind of the brains of the charging operation. And the whole system works great. The system was actually installed for us at the factory when we bought, when we bought our four wheel pop-up camper. Uh, so they did the whole install um, and everything's worked great. I don't, we really don't have a need for any more power. And as I've said, like we've actually been parked in the shade and been good for like three, four days without having to worry about trying to charge. Mm -hmm. Next one on the list that we get from a lot of people is they want to know what the negatives are of living in a soft sided camper. And they're de like noise. Perfect example. Um, you know, you're basically have about the probably a, a slightly better decibel reading inside than you would just your standard tent but you can hear people talking outside you can hear the neighbors leaf blowing um it's if there if we're in a place like a we have to park in a walmart for the night as we're traveling through it it's noisy um and that's another reason why we like going out into the middle of the forest or the desert or along the beach or something like that and it's great. I mean, we just got back from spending a, a little over a week in Baja and the entire time we were parked along the beach and we could hear the waves lapping all night long. It put us both to sleep. I mean, I was asleep like six, seven PM some nights. It, it was so relaxing. Mm -hmm. So there are positives and negatives, but I would say a negative is definitely the sound levels in here. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you've done any sort of tent camping in your life, that's pretty much the sound level level yeah. to expect in a pop-up camper when the top is up. Yep. Um, another one is condensation. Because of the way these are built and everything else, you're going to have condensation on, usually we have it on cold, humid mornings. We'll wake up and there'll be some condensation on the roof. There are ways to mitigate it. You open vents, you leave a fan on during the night. Um, you know, in the morning you just wipe it down a little bit or open the windows and everything and kind of run the fan to dry it out. It's not really, we haven't found it a problem yet. Um, you know, it's for us, it's just a little inconvenience when we do have it. Definitely have to, it's something to be mindful of whenever yes. we do wake up to condensation because if we're having to break camp really quickly that morning, we have to remember to you know, pop the top, run the fan to dry it out so mm -hmm. that it doesn't get moldy and mildewy. Yeah. Um, and the, I think the other question we get a lot too is we, especially this summer, we've camped in a lot of places with heavy, strong wind gusts, like 30, sometimes 50 miles an hour. And you can definitely feel and hear the wind hitting yes. the camper, but it's not something that has really bothered me. Has it bothered you? No, I think the only time I it might bother me, and I've, I've figured out a way to mitigate this, is the canvas itself, back here, it'll kind of go back and forth as the wind is hitting it. So what I try to do is, if there is wind, I will park in a certain direction, and I don't have the wind kind of pushing on the back of the canvas where my head is, Outside of that, this top has not, we've been in severe, severe thunderstorms. Uh, very heavy wind, almost like, what was it? Like class one hurricane force winds. Mm -hmm. And the top is fine. The top, the camper itself doesn't really seem to care. Um, it's, it could be kind of a pain in the butt if you're trying to get it down, but we've learned tricks around that. For those of you who are thinking of or have any sort of pop top camper, our advice is to seal it up close all the windows close the door and everything and then put your fan on exhaust as high as it will go or as fast as it will go and what that does is it kind of sucks the canvas in and then you can bring the top down really easily um, until we learned that it was it could be a pain in the butt sometimes but yeah you, you learn to work around these things and i think there are pros and cons to every type of vehicle why did you buy such an old truck 
there are a number of answers to that. Again, if you go to our website at wherethorussos.com, which I have left, it, it, there it is, <laughs> um, and look up truck, look up four-wheel camper, we put together an entire list of all the stuff that we've done to our truck, a lot of details as to what our considerations were going into buying an old truck. Uh, for those of you who don't know, our camper is was brand new when we purchased it. So we ordered it from the factory, 2020 model, and we put it on a 2000 Ford F350, so one ton, four by four. And our particular truck has the 7.3 diesel engine, not to be confused with the new 7.3 gas engine. Uh, so the 7.3, uh, we were looking between that or the older V10 because we didn't want to buy a brand new truck. They're just, if you look at full size trucks these days, they can go, you know, 55, 60,000 and up for, you know, something decent. And we wanted a diesel. We we're also looking for gas, maybe a V10. But in order for us to consider a diesel, we were looking at older diesels, the older 7.3 or 6.0. Um, and the reason for that is that in a lot of third world countries, they don't have ultra low sulfur diesel, which is what is sold in the US, Canada, almost all of Europe. And ultra low sulfur diesel is meant uh, for emissions. Well, the issue with that is that the newer vehicles that are meant to run on that type of diesel if you put the older low sulfur diesel in them, it can clog up the engine and cause all sorts of harm, thereby voiding your warranty uh, if you have one on the vehicle. So it limits the places that you can travel. Now with the old diesel, this 7.3 of ours, we can put virtually anything we want in it and it'll run, diesel that is. Uh, people even put gear oil in and they can run it. So this engine itself, it's known for reliability. Um, a lot of these engines have go, gone half a million to a million miles or more. And the truck we were looking for, we wanted something, initially we wanted something with just an extended cab, but then we started looking at uh, crew cabs, you know, four doors, and we needed something with four wheel drive. And out of all the trucks that were out there, the Fords really appealed to us the most. So if we wanted an old diesel, uh, our options were kind of like 1999 and up for the diesel we were looking for. We didn't want an old body style Ford. And up to about 2006, 2007, when they stopped making the Ford 6.0 diesel motor. Uh, the 6.0, great engine, but it had to be bulletproofed. And that was a lot of other money that would have been out of pocket if it wasn't done already. So that's why we ended up with this truck. While this engine is reliable, we have had bugs to work out. We've had sensors go bad. Uh, we've had some seals go bad and just general things with having a 20 year old truck. And when we do have those problems, when we're out on the road, we can pull into an O'Reilly and I've done a sensor change in the O'Reilly parking lot because not only did they have the sensor, they had the wiring harness I need and all the other parts that are right there at hand. So I don't have to go in special order or anything. And to that point, we've had to visit a few mechanics this year, especially if you follow us on Instagram. Um, we posted some stories of breakdowns and things, and every mechanic that has worked on our truck has said they know the 7.3s really well because mm -hmm. there's just so many of them, and they work on them, so they know them. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of nice, too. It's yeah, and we can take these into... We've even gone and had a repair done at a uh, semi-truck uh, repair shop and that was actually kind of nice because they had showers and laundry there for us and they knew the engine they knew how to work on it and it we were in and out so even with new vehicles we've met people um, there's a friend of ours who his transmission went out on his new ram um, other people with fords they have problems out of the box there you know there's a reason why there are recalls and warranties on vehicles because things happen and we just decided to get an older truck. We knew it was going to be some more work. Uh, but at the same time, we saved a significant amount of money, which has allowed us to, you know, put some of the cool bells and whistles on this thing that we may not have been able to afford doing on a new truck. 
how many miles are on the truck right now and what is your mpg okay um i believe we're right around 233,000 miles we bought it with just over 200,000, so we put a number of miles on it already in just over a year and let's see mpg mpg right now i made a few fix i tuned the engine a bit made a few fixes and we're getting on average about 13 to 14 depending on the terrain uh, even in mountainous terrain we get around 13 ish which surprisingly is better than most of the camper vans we were in uh, our time that we spent in a mercedes sprinter we were getting 14 14 and a half on the high end and you know we can do that in this truck oh and before i forget uh, we have a article on our website that details every single modification that Joe has made to the truck and upgrades. So if you are interested in a full breakdown of our truck or the camper, just head over to our website and you can get all the information there. Yep. All right. There we go. All right. What flatbed did you go with and what size is it? Hmm. We ended up going with the Norweld uh, tray. It is their Weekender Deluxe with the boxes and it has an 11 gallon auxiliary water tank. Um, we have the seven foot model. And the reason we decided to go with Norweld was it was specifically for putting campers on or other types of you know adventure type tents or other things on it. It had the storage boxes and it seemed like for us the best way to go. There are a lot of other flatbeds out there. We actually bought our truck with a flatbed already on it, but it was steel and it was just way too heavy for what we wanted to do. So we ended up going with an all aluminum flatbed from Norwell. So far, we absolutely love it. We haven't had any issues with it, knock on wood, and it looks cool. The follow-up is, how is the camper attached to the flatbed and is it easy to take the camper off and put it back on? So the camper is attached to the flatbed. It's bolted to the flatbed, I believe in four places. Um, I don't know how hard or easy it would be to take off because we've never tried. We don't even have the jacks to do it. We do have the points on the camper to uh, attach the jacks if we wanted to, but since we live out of this full time, we really decided uh, we didn't have any reason to want to take it off. And But that said, I think it would be I think it would be a bit of a chore to do. Um, not only to get to some of the bolts to undo the camper itself, but to get it off and then line the truck back up with the bolt holes all in the same place. So while we can do it, if we had to, I think it would be a chore to do and not something that we would really plan to do. And last pre-planned question is where do you where do you get the beer can opener sidestep? <laughs> so that is a, that's also a Norweld product. So it's made for their tray. And we just, we got it through four wheel campers when we ordered our camper. So we kind of picked out all the options we wanted on our camper. Um, they gave us a build date and then we also ordered the flatbed tray with it along with the little uh, sidestep that we have, beer can openers, everyone likes to call it. Mm -hmm. That thing is awesome. Yeah, we used to have the accordion steps, but they were just a lot to lug around and to put up and put down every time. And what we found ourselves doing was most of the time just putting the little you know, beer can opener thing on the side of the truck and popping in. So we ended up selling the stairs. Okay, before we go into some of the questions I grabbed from the chat, uh, I was giggling because everyone's been asking about the fuzzy thing. <laughs> on the camper and some people think it's a butter. It's it's and a someone said it's utterly hilarious. Alright, you wanna tell them what it is? I just think it's so funny that everyone latched onto this. Um well I will show you before I tell you. Perhaps you can figure it out. <laughs> So, tell them. Uh, this is a pretend dead bunny. 
It's a bunny that is pretending to be dead. And it was a gift to me from my cousin when we were visiting China. And it's a very popular little stuffed animal there. And so I like to hang it up over here. And it's super soft. Are you able to use the Instant Pot without being connected to shore power? Yes. So we don't need to be connected to shore power to use anything. And we actually haven't ever connected to shore power. Um, our big battery bank, 300 amp hours of Battleborn lithium batteries, is enough to power everything we have in the camper. Uh, we can actually run Kate's Instant Pot, which is 750 watts, and my electric kettle, which is 1,000 watts, both at the same time, off of our 2,000 watt pure sign inverter. So to give everyone, a, I guess, a little lesson in RV power systems, um, everything is run off of the batteries. Uh, a lot of people have made the mistake of saying that, you know, asking if you can run things off the solar. The solar is just there to send a charge into the batteries. All the power from the inverter or anything else you're using comes from the batteries and it goes into, you know, the 12 volt appliances like our refrigerator, the heater, stuff like that. Once we turn on our inverter, it's pulling power from the batteries. The solar itself is just charging the batteries. It doesn't actually run anything. Uh, Diane sent another super chat. She said, that coffee cup on Instagram, I can't find it. Oh, she, I think she's talking about the giveaway. Oh, here, grab it. So we are, we run a lot of giveaways on Instagram um, and we just launched one yesterday yes so if you're interested in checking that out also head over to instagram but this is the uh the latest giveaway yeah what it is um a friend of ours turned us on to this it is a the brew trek overlander french press and what i love about it is you could use it like a coffee cup if i can get the top open there we go so it has a lid on it this is the press portion of it you take the top off put your coffee grounds and everything in and then after you're done making coffee so here's what separates this you can take this off and just dump your coffee grounds out one of the problems with being in an RV or a small space is you're limited on water but you also don't want to put coffee grounds in that down the drain so this makes it really easy to get the coffee grounds out and clean it um, and it's just, it's nice. It, it works really well. It's insulated. It is fantastic. And I use this all the time. Uh, if I'm making coffee for multiple people at once, um, use it for myself. But, you know, Kate has kind of gotten back into drinking coffee. So it's nice in the morning. I'll make a press and then pour it for both of us. And it keeps it nice and hot if you don't drink the whole thing at once. Um, if you want to, we're giving away two from Brew Trek and Planetary Design. So head on over to our Instagram uh, channel and you can see it there. There you go. And also, um, I know we have quite a few patrons on the live stream. Just a reminder that our video Zoom call is this Saturday. So make sure you join us if you can. Um, probably might be the last one. This Oh no, it's November. Yeah, we have okay. one in December. Yeah. So. For those who don't know, we do have a Patreon page. Um, if you want to check it out, it's patreon.com slash we're the Russos. Um, but one fun thing we do is once a month, we will have a uh, basically a live stream with everybody. We'll get on a Zoom call and you know I'll chat with everyone. We've A lot of us have become friends. There's some ongoing inside jokes with the whole group now. Uh, Pete, Especially with Pete, who yeah. was on earlier. I don't know if he's still on. I think he's a professional Zoomer because he has some cool <laughs> stuff that he does. And it just, it's a lot of fun. It's a great way to connect with all of you on a more personal basis. Uh, this is fun too. So, you know, we're, we love doing like the live streams and everything else. And it's just, it's a shame we haven't done one in such a long time. Well, we haven't had good reliable <laughs> Wi-Fi. I mean, we've been doing so much boondocking um, and just being off grid that we don't have the data yeah. to do these live streams. So I'm glad we had the opportunity to do it today. I just have to read you this comment really quickly. And then I think it's probably time to then we call it a day to call it. It's been over 50 minutes. Wow. Um, 
I don't know why, but the crease in your shirt makes the camper look like a DeLorean. Oh, it does. <laughs> By the way, if you guys like the shirt, we do, I think, at the below near the doobly doo where you type <laughs> stuff with with jazz hands, um, you know, below this video, there are links to these t shirts, and I've gotten a lot of comments about it. People like it. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next time. If you want to learn more about a lot of the stuff we've spoken about today, especially the camper and the truck, head on over to our website, use the search bar and type in four wheel campers or Ford truck. Or if you're just looking for a cool camping experience, type the area you're going to and we've probably written about it. So we'll see you next time. Thank you guys so much. Take care. Bye.